welcome back to the Future Print Leaders Summit for our next session, which is going to be a discussion, maybe even a debate, actually. It's the inkjet head-to-head. And we're questioning thin film or bulk piezo, two different types of inkjet head with different attributes. I have with me today some of the leaders in inkjet and more specifically in inkjet head technology. We're joined by Richard Darling, who's Head of Strategic Sales at Rika Europe. Welcome, Richard. Thank you. John Mills, who's CEO of Zar. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Martin, Martin Schopler, who's the CEO of Fujifilm Dynamics and has got up super early today. So thank you, Martin and Carlin in from California. And Hello. We have, welcome. And we have also Mark Bale, who's CEO of Dynamics Act, who's an independent expert helps people make the right choices with the ancient technology. Is that right? Oh. That's right. A bit of a smaller company, but very happy to be here to talk about the head. Fantastic. Well, it is a small technology, isn't it? With um, a big impact, of course. So we have an objective with this session. I've written this down, and we, um, the objective really is to define, discuss, and to, to debate the value and difference between thin film and, and bulk piezo, and the strengths of both, really to see and perhaps understand, learn, and hear really what these top experts have to say. So I'm going to start really with the first basic question. The place to start is, what are inkjet heads? Mark, you're going to um, explain to us what an inkjet head is and why it's so important. Well, I think the reason people are talking about future print is because there's a lot of digital that is defining the future of manufacturing as well as production of things like packaging and underpinning a, a good amount of that is inkjet technology. So that's the print head is the functioning part of delivering those inks to the surface that's being decorated. And so by definition, it's non-contact with jetting fluid across a gap. And today we're going to be talking about piezo heads. So we're talking about thin film versus bulk. So by definition, we're talking about a subsection of print heads where the actuation, the actual drop formation process is made by a piezo, which is like a bit of like the inverse effect of trying to strike a flame with a lighter. Instead of making charge by pushing something, we're making something move by applying electricity to it. And that's basically how piezos work. So it's little small things that push drops across gaps in order to make lovely printed items. Fantastic. And could you explain perhaps perhaps john um drop on demand that's is that is that something that's unique to piezo because there was there is a thing called t- continuous inkjet is are we is this technology more <clears throat> yeah so I, I think there's this continuous inkjet is a, is a technology where you get a stream of uh, of ink in, it, in like a jet uh, and then you you vibrate that stream and it breaks up into droplets and then you can deflect droplets to positions uh, it's typically used to put in sell-by dates on the bottom of um, products. So if you if you look at a product and you see uh, a, a little bit of print on there, that's typically done by uh, drop-on demand. Uh, by sorry, by um, continuous inkjet. Uh, drop-on demand is as, as you speak. If you you then get a drop when you when you want it. So if you put a voltage to the piezo, it will move as Mark just explained, and and fire a drop out. And by putting voltages to these individual nozzles you can create patterns and shapes and all sorts of things in, in, in inkjet and, and on, on the thin film versus bulk the dependent is is how you create the piezo do you do you take a lump of piezo like a like a house brick and then machine it down into to the shape that you want or do you start with a with a form and then deposit a thin film of them um, piezo onto a preformed um, shape and that's really the difference between what we're talking about uh, today thank you very much martin you're um not calling in from california so we need to, to have you next really the, um the business you operate and there's uh, you've been a um, ceo for many years now um you have um quite a lot of interest and expertise with thin film um john's kind of given us a little bit of a insight there as to the difference thin film what is the advantage of a thin film um, inkjet head? Okay, maybe just uh, the fundamentals of what, what it means, uh, thin film. We, we actually call it silicon MEMS 
Um, it is basically a combination of uh, multiple technologies. It's uh, the semiconductor technology, which is uh, wafer-based instead of a uh, uh, single device. And you create from the wafer multiple devices depending on the size. Uh, the second is, um, uh, like uh, John said, uh, it is um, a very thin film PSO uh, structure uh, put direct onto the wafer compared to bulk. And that is a, a main difference. Uh, between those two, it is um, it needs uh, so-called deep etching, which is another uh, technology used in the in the uh, semiconductor and uh, and uh, storage industry. And the combination of those three semiconductor wafer-based uh, PSO films and uh, deep etching creates three-dimensional structures, which uh, allows uh, what Mark said before the uh, actuation of uh, uh, the, the droplets being uh, being pushed out compared to uh, you know a thermal a thermal uh, printhead or other uh, continuous uh, printhead uh, technology. So it it is it is uh, uh, the utilization of a lot of uh, modern semiconductor and, and other technologies combined into something which is called thin film uh, PSO heads. And and is it relatively new? Um, technology, or has it been around for many years? Uh, the, the the first uh, uh, was probably uh, Epson, I would say. We started in 2002 with uh, the first uh, thin film uh, technology and uh, moved from there. That, that first technology used still a bulk film, which we uh, were polishing down. Since uh, 2008, we are using uh, a spotted PCT technology, which we also apply for a lot of other uh, products. Uh, it's not only uh, done for inkjet, it can be done for ultrasound, medical transducers, for uh, sensors. So it has become kind of, uh, MEMS has, has grown uh, as, a, as a market and as a technology, and we are, we are utilizing those uh, advancements in, uh, in, in the inkjet technology as well. Excellent. Um, thank you for that, Richard. Um, you obviously got, uh, have a view on on things from um, and what we do. Um, what are the um, in your view, perhaps the advantages of of, of bulk liaison? We've learned that thin film is kind of a new technology that's very um, in terms of manufacturing. That means bulk piezo is, is is not not as good. That's a that's a big question, Marcus. Um, I think I heard you right. The the, the volume's um, a bit muffled. Um, bulk piezo is um, as good at some things and not as good at other things. Um, thin film extends the capability of um, inkjet technology um, in some directions, uh, but bulk piezo is uh, is is has has other capabilities that thin film may not have. Um, and, and we can debate that, but um, I think that the the advent of thin film is 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 actually rather than carving the chambers out of a, another material like um, PZT, the piezoelectric material, or making them up out of uh, uh, metal or laminates of metal or or whatever, you can actually make the structures in a foundry in the in the in in the in the thin film silicon MEMS um, environment. All print heads are. MEMS by definition, because that's a sub 20 micron um, micro uh, electric electromechanical system. So they're all MEMS, but it's just the materials and the manufacturing process that's different. The use of PZT is um, more frugal in uh, a thin film head. So you're depositing a thin layer rather than sort of using a big block of it. Um, and uh, there are various manufacturers in the bulk piezo where you can actually um, John, you'd say you're actually making a chamber out of the PZT. Um, in other cases, um, other printhead manufacturers actually just glue a big piece of PZT or several big pieces of PZT onto the top of the, the diaphragm, which is the chamber roof, and um, and then they actuate it from there. So they're different methods, but it's it actually is all using the amount of PZT. So thin film uses a smaller amount, and because the manufacturing process of the um, of the printhead itself, uh, I think Martin would agree that it's, it lends itself to producing complex structures um, with a high degree of precision and repeatability. 
So that, that means that in the fluidic path, you can actually create the structure that's ideal for the application and you can do it repeatedly with low variation. Uh, I think you'd agree with that, Martin? Yes, I agree. Uh, there are basically uh, four steps uh, in which, I, which are ideal. There is the modeling, which is uh, the same for uh, bulk PCT uh, or, or bulk uh, uh, inkjet and uh, for thin film. But from the modeling to the design of the three-dimensional structure to the, um, to the mask making to the uh, going into the fab is a direct, a direct uh, process. And then the repeatability, like you mentioned, uh, with a wafer, uh, one wafer to the next is basically the same mask. And so it's a very precise technology to repeat this, you know, uh, uh, print head from one to N, you know, uh, units. And I, I think that's, in answer to your question, Mark, is what, what, what's built bulk PAs are not so good at. And I would say manufacturing variability um, in the print head manufacturing process, because you're, you're actually taking the material and putting them all together in a, in a way which uh, has uh, an innate error um, associated with it. So you get variability. And if you're, if you're trying to aim for really precise structures that get the fluid to where it needs to be, and as Mark says, to throw it across that gap with the right mass and the right velocity and the right direction, then you can probably do that easier with silicon manufacturing than you can with the other forms of manufacturing print heads. Uh, there might be another debate um, as, to, as to whether that's actually necessary or whether the volumes of manufacture actually meet, um, make it necessary. Yeah. But I think we'll come <laughs> on to that. Yeah. Yeah. John. I, I, John I, yeah. yeah. No, I, th I, I mean, all that, I, I agree. I, th I think the, key, the thing with um, uh, thin film versus um, bulk is it really comes down to the application that, you, that you're looking at because if you take um, an application where you want extremely high resolution and high speed accurate drop placement, it's going to be difficult to compete with uh, uh, silicon MEMS because as you know, we just talked about, the accuracy of deposition is going to be much higher through that, um, through that process. If you have a more of an industrial application where the thing that really defines the complexity of the problem is 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 the fluid that's being jetted. So if it's a very challenging fluid that is high vis viscosity, it's higher pigment loading. The chances are the thin film head will struggle to print that, and it's more appropriate for a bulk head because it has a wider uh, operating window. And I think you know if you look at Dymatics, they kind of distinguish between industrial heads and silicon MEMS um, heads, and I think that's a really useful way of actually thinking about it because we certainly see that when it comes to the more industrial applications, those requirements typically lend themselves better to a bulk type of um, system. So, so I think it really depends on the type of application that you're, that you're looking at to which technology uh, fits the best. Mm -hmm. and, and, and Mark, um, thank you for that, John. Um, uh, Mark, do, do, do people understand the differences in terms of um, the two technologies? Because I frankly hadn't really computed myself what the differences were. I mean, so bulk piezo is good for one thing, thin film is good for another. Simple as that. Is is that right, or is there, is there confusion in the market? I think there's definitely potential for confusion, and it's our job mm. as suppliers and mm. with people who help suppliers like myself to um, to actually try and you know fix that confusion. So. Of course, print heads come in all different shapes and sizes, which aren't necessarily just defined by the manufacturing route of the piezo part. And they come with different architectures that lend to their application in different uses from textiles to ceramic tiles through mm. to printing very, very fast onto roll-to-roll -roll corrugated machines. And I think the, the, the important distinguishing characteristics are, are really down to the viscosity of the inks that can be put through the head, the chemistry of those inks in terms of aggressivity and in, in terms of the, the subsequent suitability for application, which discriminates then between oil, aqueous, etc. And then finally, it's the drop size that suits for application, whether it's a large distance it's got to throw it, or it's a smaller distance that can be better controlled, really determines the success in making an application reliable. And what's definitely 
um, enabled Inkjet over the last few years to pick up how much of market penetration it's achieved is that it's got more and more reliable. And a lot of that has come from the recirculation innovations that have enabled chemistry to address those print requirements. So yes, it is complex. I, I help by training people on the differences and uh, in, in an independent way that can compare printhead technology as do other providers. And I think that the important thing is for people to know that the application defines both the chemistry and the inkjet head selection. And it, the head suppliers do an excellent job of meeting those requirements in complementary delivery with the fluid suppliers like ink companies. And that's, that's the thing that matters. It matters that you get the right combination. Mm. And the difference we're discussing today really comes down to how typically expressed a thin film silicon MEMS head is more likely to be suitable for higher speed applications where precision and high print resolution, you can talk about that one again, is required. And um, where maybe a bit more flexibility on fluid is required, where bulk is um, has an advantage, as we've heard from John. And you mentioned the word recirculation there. John, do you, 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 recirculation, explain, <coughs> explain why, why that's important. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you look at some of the challenges when you put a fluid through a print head, um, you know, if you uh, if you open a bottle of Coca Cola, mm. it tends to fizz up, and and that's because you've got dissolved, you know, in that case, nitrogen in the in in the in the fluid. Uh, in in an ink that goes into an inkjet head, you have oxygen that's dissolved in it, and when it's in a head, you've got a piezo that's moving around, and and it can kind of create, it can cause that fluid, that air to come out of the fluid and create bubbles, and that but those bubbles can effectively block the block the nozzle, and and so recirculation is important because the unless if the only way out of the print head is through the nozzle that bubble can block the uh, the head. So you kind of want to have a path for those blockages to, 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 move, to move out. And the same when you've got a pigmented ink, if you open a tin of paint after you've it's been sat on the shelf for a few months, you know, the pigment sort of sits down, you have to give it a good stir. Well, if you've got a print head and you've got ink that's in there and it's pigmented, the ink will settle down and come out and, and sometimes can clump together in lumps. All of those things, can block the uh, block the nozzle. So, like the air bubbles, you need the, the, those bigger particles to have a route out of the print head. So, when you when you talk about recirculation, there are there are different ways that that's uh, that's achieved. Uh, you know, typically in in many heads, you have <clears throat> recirculation down a chamber, down a down a channel that sits behind the firing chamber. Um, uh, in, in our heads, the, re the recirculation is, is is really right behind the uh, the nozzle plate, and has advantages uh, in, in there. As other problems, you know, so you know, you, you typically don't get one thing unless you give up on a, on something else in in, in inkjet as many other things. But recirculation is really key because you know you've got a you know twenty thirty micron uh, nozzle, and uh, anything that goes into the print head that's bigger than that can block the nozzle unless there's another way for it to get out and recirculation is key to uh, try and avoid that. And, and, and is recirculation uh, common in thin film and in bulk piezo? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, you, you typically find, I mean, I, uh, I think all thin film heads have, um, have recirculation um, as far as where mm. they, you don't have to have recirculation. There are very, very successful um, heads on the market that don't have recirculation. Um, mm. uh, it depends on the application. Um, recirculation can also be helpful with with water-based things because one of the challenges with water-based things is that the, the nozzles dry out. So if you if you mm. print in the same image for half an hour and the nozzle's not being used, it can dry out, and uh, and and you have to put then chemicals into the fluid to stop the ink drying in the nozzle but the problem is when you print the image it then stops the image drying on the substrates you need more heat and you have to slow the machine down so if you can try and get 
the recirculation to go behind the nozzle plate and keep it wet, then you can limit the amount of chemicals that go in your ink and it will you can machine run faster and you'll use less heat to, to, to dry it. So so you get into these second level of um, complexities in uh, geometry and bulk and recirculation is not a function of PET, whether it's thin film or bulk, it's a choice of uh, design. Recirculation adds cost to the print head, it adds cost to the ink system. So, you know, it, but it will add reliability to the, to, to, the, to the system. So it depends, again, what you want to try and achieve. If you've gone to the point of trouble of investing in a thin film head because you want that kind of high quality, high speed, and the integration is, is quite complicated, but the rewards are there, chances are you're going to want, you want, to, you're going to, want to invest in the uh, recirculation to maximise the, 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 the benefit there. If, you, if you're at the other end of the market and you, you've got a relatively low cost solution um, in terms of system, then do I really want to invest in a, in a recirculating system when actually just a straightforward uh, non-recirculating system will, will do? Yeah, so f f thank you for that. So what it sounds like to me is this is a, an element to which y you could you could have a range of products as an OEM with different machines with, mm. with different types of heads in them. Could be thin film, could be bulk piezo. So on that basis, it isn't really a competition, is it? Or is it? Mm. I, I, I think if it, I, I think it was a competition, Marcus. Small companies like Zara wouldn't have a, a hope against these kind of you know bigger bigger mm. organisations. And I think that the mm. The, the great thing is, 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 is there's a huge market out there and every every mm. week there's there's new parts of, of, of industries that are converting from analog to digital print. So I think the, the opportunity space is growing and I think that as that grows, there is clearly going to be products that match well for certain sectors. And we for, mm. certainly see for, for ourselves, you know, the, there are sectors I think we will be very strong in and there are other sectors where I wouldn't dream of going up against, you know, Martin's Samba print head in certain applications because I know we would we would absolutely lose and because it's a fantastic head and for those for those applications. But there are other applications where I think we would do we'd be pretty strong. Um, and for us it's we'll focus on that and do the things mm. that we know how to do well. But th the challenge for um a customer and OEM is is where it's very clear. I think it's easy. Where people like Mark need to help people out is that there are areas where it's not clear whether they should go recirculating thin film versus bulk versus that. That's where the, the challenge comes. And I think there are a lot of applications you could go different routes, uh, and you've got to go down to that next level of uh, sophistication and complexity. Okay, thanks. Martin, do you, uh, with the, the kind of investment that you've made in thin films or as Fuge Film Dymatics has in thin film, you obviously see a future where everything will be thin film. Uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, if I okay. um, continue what, uh, what John just uh, finished, uh, basically every day I get um, uh, customer reports. Uh, there are clear customers, you know, who would never use a thin film head because it's a heavy industrial and they wouldn't even think of uh, uh, using anything but a bulk. There, is a, there are customers who would never use anything but thin film because, uh, you know, product because they go high speed, single pass versus uh, scanning. It's another element of differentiation. And then there are a lot of customers who are in between and they try both. Um, so for us, uh, we we don't want to say that, uh, you know, the bulk um, uh, or industrial print heads, as I call it, uh, are, are out. We, of course, invest uh, uh, more and more into thin film because we believe in it. We have the Samba technology. We are coming with the uh, technology of um, uh, uh, just below that, in uh, which is more in that middle section where you can you can think of uh, both technologies. We believe it has an advantage from a manufacturability, from a repeatability, from uh, using using um, a fabrication, from modeling to a uh, wafer based. Uh, it has the, the if you want a, a type of Moore's law in a different way, from uh, you know a small wafer to large wafer. We just uh, start uh, the production of eight inch wafer, which is doubling the capacity on how many print heads you can have on a wafer compared to six inch. So we believe in the technology, we believe in um, 
in the scale we have uh, as a as a as an investment we have done and uh, continue to invest but uh, we're not giving up on our industrial grade uh, uh, printheads which we uh, have like the starfire uh, which we make in the the other facility in new hampshire okay so that's 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 good to hear so you, you you're invested in thin film well richard t tell us a bit about the economics from what Martin and, and, and Fujifilm, and, and I, I assume also Rico, have invested a lot in terms of the, the production of thin film heads or silicon MEMS is, is significant. Is that fair to say? Um, to make them and to buy them? Is that, do the economics well, stack up? That, that's, that's, um, that's something I've questioned. Um, and I think that uh, there are some, several interesting things. The distinction between industrial and non-industrial, if we call it not industrial, non-industrial, I think most of the people who are developing with either inkjet technology for a single pass device, mm -hmm. they would consider their application to be in the main industrial. Um, so I'm not sure the, the word industrial, the word industrial is actually to, is, it's, it's a process of creating a product at the end, whether that's packaging, whether it's um, uh, furniture board or flooring, uh, or whether, whether it's anything else, but it's, it's, it's all considered for an industrial application. Now, the speed is one thing. Um, the chemistry is another, as we've alluded to. I think if you if you're trying to put, if you see it as the, the print head is a delivery device and the fluid is what the customer really wants, the end customer, it's got to give properties on a substrate. It's got to perform in a particular way, whether that's abrasion, light fastness, or whatever. And and then as John mentioned, there's the the drying in the process has to be taken into account, drying or curing. Um, so you put things in to keep the nozzles open, but you don't want those things when you get to the later stages, the subsequent process of drying. Um, the bigger the window, the more you can tailor the fluid the, for the delivery device, the more you can tailor the fluid for the industrial process, which is what the, the end product is in, 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 its, um, in, the, in the final stage. Um, and the, the, the sharper the technology, we call it sharper, the, the the, the, hard, the, the, the more developed it is, the more refined, then often you compromise on the tolerance of fluid types of materials. There are some, some other factors in there as well. It gets more compl complicated. It's, it's like peeling an onion. Um, if, you, mm. if, you, um, if you look at that, that sector that is suitable for fast printing thin film, that takes into account that there could be a need for speed. Analog is much faster than inkjet. Um, there could be a need for speed. There could be a need for higher resolution. And, and, and those thin film structures can deliver higher resolution more reliably. Uh, there are limits on, on bulk there. So with those factors, you've got a subsector of the digital, digitalized world that can be addressed by thin film. And you've got a sector that can be addressed by bulk. Now, I think the calculation of the economics depends on the volume of print heads you can supply. Uh, traditionally, um, thin film is an expensive business to develop and to produce with heavy overheads as well as the, uh, the, the, the direct costs of a product. So if you're producing in high volume, you can, you can turn a profit. If you're not producing in high volume, then it's very, very difficult and you can easily make huge losses. So it depends on the available market size. Uh, if, if we all need to print at high resolution in every application, and the fluid window, the, to the fluid property window is sufficiently wide uh, that you can meet the needs of the industrial products that are to be produced by inkjet, um, then maybe, maybe there's enough demand for thin film to wash its face. If there isn't, then there could be problems. And traditionally, the companies like Ricoh, Epson, um, particularly Konica Minolta too, we sort of look at the document world as a world where we generate the volume of printers, office printers, desktop printers, whatever it is. Um, the last 12 months have taught us that office printing, we, we, we've been talking about paperless offices for the last decades, but now we're, we're going officeless. So mm. there's, there's very little printing being actually done, which is good in one sense, good for the environment, but it takes away the, the development engine, the thing that, thing that funds this, this technology drive, um, and it, it, it must necessarily, therefore, uh, get us to, to, to redefine what the industrial markets are and what the needs of those industrial markets are. And in my view, I'd, I'd like to set this up as a challenge. I, I think 
the economics are very, very difficult to break even with the costs of thin film development at the, the available market size. John, do you want to step in? Yeah, well, the, 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 <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I, Richard, I agree with all that. I think that the, you know, we've, you know, we're uniquely positioned um, because we we had a very successful, um, technically very successful thin film um, program, but we just couldn't afford to, to sustain it. I mean, we were we were spending twenty million pounds a year just to keep the doors open on on the ability to produce thin film um, technology, you know, and uh, and without the volume to support that, you're absolutely right, Richard. You make too much of a loss, and we had to shut down the thin film program. But that was for those reasons, not for technical reasons. I, I think what's interesting is that you know if we look at um, the Martin's you know head, the Samba, which is the most successful industrial thin film head on the market by far. Uh, um, you, you know, uh, I think that you know this. This is my guess, but I think that. Dimatics have probably invested, you know, a billion dollars or some some figure into that into that uh, into that technology to get it to where it is today. I can't see any other organisation investing that much money in technology to get to that point, given the given the opportunity. And I think the the, the challenge for the for the space is that if you come in the other direction, which is where Epson have come from, and maybe you know, from from an office base, is that the the thin film product developed by um, Dymatics was developed for the industrial market with features that enable it to do things that you don't need in the office space and taking an office printer and trying to get it to work in an industrial thing it might have the economics and the price point you know the Epson printer is you know per nozzle probably the cheapest product out there but I think if you put it head to head with Martin's um, product does the functionality does it have the functionality to actually have as you said earlier the operating window to to be to be useful in a in enough in enough sectors and I, and I think that's the that's the test I can't see anybody else coming into the to the in space developing a true industrial thin film head because I think the investment is too 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 high and, and I think therefore those that are already there and in it and have made the investment you know they, that sunk cost is sunk and you, you keep going um, but I think that for um, for, for the size of the, the market you, you know I, I can't see how anybody else would, would, would do it but I think you're absolutely right it's about operating window and, and, and there's a huge market in you know printing of um, graphics and textiles and, and packaging where thin film is absolutely appropriate but when you go into more challenging fluids then you, you know the, the the biggest thing is not well how much it costs or what it it's fundamentally got to work first because there's no point having a cheaper head or a high resolution head if it physically won't um, work so i think that um operating window is one of the key thing that drives which head you ultimately use um, and i think the economical point is 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 going to be down to thin film is always going to be the, the cheapest per nozzle if the volume is there and and and, and the, the big question is is can dimatics and others in that point get enough volume to sustain that thin film uh, model quickly enough um, to, to make it work and given that Martin's been doing it since 2002 I suspect that he's probably kind of doing okay at the moment um, <laughs> but uh, it's uh, but I think that's the thing I, I personally can't see anybody else joining that unless um, you know unless unless anybody knows any any different could I come back in on that Marcus yeah um, please do. I, I think uh, the, the the point is that and I agree with you that if for, the, for those packaging, textile type of things, thin films, it can be very appropriate um, uh, and it can be used. Um, it's really a question of whether bulk can't be. And I, th I think there's, that's, that's in the, the overlap area because um, we mentioned re recirculation. If you're recirculating, then you have the motion of, the, of, of the, the printing process. So the carriage is moving back and forth. To manage the pressures in a recirculating system is limiting. It adds a lot of expense, and you perhaps have to limit the speed with which you print. Now, thin film suitable for, for, for speed, and we're talking over two meters per second here. Um, you can't really very easily achieve more than two meters per second on a scanning device. So then for speed, it, it sort of limits it to 
it, it sort of tends towards the bulk end of things. And then if you look at uh, resolution, well, in a scanning system, you're building up the resolution, so you don't need a native high-resolution printhead. So in scanning systems, you don't tend to see too many other than the, 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 the Epson sort or the, the, the Ricoh um, one-inch thin film TH5241. Um, they're, they're suitable for that kind of device. But then Samba is more industrial. Uh, sorry, Martin, the distinction is thin film and industrial, but it's, it's intended more for the single pass world. Um, in single pass, then that limits, that's a sector of the volume that's available for industrial processes. So you're, you're, you're taking it out of the, the multi-pass market, putting it into the single pass market. And then within, sing, within those single pass applications, you have to consider the fluids that are used, the viscosity of the fluids, and the throw distance. And you have to consider lots of things, including is speed necessary? And then, then we get into that type of debate on whether we actually need a Volvo estate or whether we need a Porsche 911 or a Ferrari, whatever you want to choose. Um, and, and that's even if there is let's say it's 50 50 then you're again limiting the available market for thin film and then there's one other factor is if with samba which i agree samba's the it's the, it's the only show in town if somebody comes along with another thin film device then you halve the market potentially um that's over simplistic i know but if you halve the market then the volume for neither um is prob probably not enough Hmm. So, Martin, a lot, a lot has been said there by, by Richard and, and, and John. And, and from what I can hear, you're either in a really great position or you, you're in a position where you've got to find a lot of new business to pay for the investment. What's your view of the future? Uh, let me make two comments. One comment uh, on what, what has, uh, is said, said before in terms of uh, the, the generation or the production uh, yes, you need a fab, and uh, we're fortunate to have a fab. Um, uh, we're moving that to 8-inch. Uh, what we experienced is uh, that it is very, very difficult to think of a fabless uh, you know, company, which is very common in the semiconductor industry, where you design a chip and uh, you use TSMC and they produce it for you. Uh, in, the, in the thin film inkjet uh, technology, that's very difficult because the iteration cycles are, you know, uh, very, very uh, frequent, and the uh, the complexity of the the PSO material, the three dimensional structure, and the semiconductor fabrication makes that you know very complex. So we believe a fabless mm. uh, inkjet company in thin film is is very very difficult. In terms of uh, the applications, uh, we we certainly know that uh, inkjet printheads go into printers. Uh, increasingly, there are applications where you know basically a printer is not suitable, but it's a print engine uh, solution which goes direct into the customer's uh, flow of the product, whether that's in packaging, uh, different types of packaging or uh, other elements, and you basically need then to accustom uh, or adapt to the uh, customer's uh, speed and uh, movement. And a lot of those, or majority of those, are actually uh, single pass. And that's where, you know, the, uh, the uh, Samba technology and our future technology is, uh, is ideal from what we see in terms of applications, in addition to the high-speed uh, single pass uh, printers, which uh, are currently in the market. Okay, thank you. And, and, and Mark, so we've been listening patiently there as, a, as our independent and also with, a, with expertise in ink chemistry. Is this, is this sort of development very much a collaboration uh, requirement going forward in terms of um, being able to realise the value of both technologies and grow ink into new markets? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. To maximise, mm -hmm. like I said before, it comes down to reliability. What a customer wants to do with a printer is make stuff and therefore make money. So in being able to do that at the appropriate volume and noting back to what Richard said about speed, it's not always about speed, it's about product mix. It's about mm. the ability to, to contribute a value add to the business mm. at which a print is installed. Some of that will be volume. And in a lot of the markets we've spoken about already, that is. And other ones, it's about making something that otherwise isn't possible through traditional mm. means. 
And so the value add isn't necessarily going to be speed based. And in each of the cases for every application, then it's the combination of chemistry and head that defines the success. And like it's been said earlier, it's the ink that you want. It's, it's that's what ends up as part of the product. The print head is a delivery mechanism. You choose it for the best possible delivery for the needs of the process. And mm. um, when we look at recirculation as a, a chemistry enabler, it's been a very significant one across a range of applications. But you don't have to be thin film to recirculate, and you don't have to be. Um, you don't have to be. Mm. Um, you don't have to be bulk to be a multiple pass print head. So that that you know, mm. it's it's about what what print head specification meets the application and delivers the ink was needed, not how it's made. And um, so how it's made is an enabler to certain ends of that spectrum. And of course, the high speed end of the spectrum is what we've heard about today and very much the, um, very much the world at which um, silicon MEMS bin film heads operate because only that type of technology is able to compete with the CIJ or thermal inkjet alternatives also benefit from the silicon manufacturing technologies that Martin spoke about. So in that competitive environment, then it's those heads that will have the capability just on a spec level to have that competition. But when you look at the diversity of inkjet uses, then that's again where the some of the, the bulk heads as we're calling them, the industrial heads, the ones which are been known to be in printers for 10 years and plus and still be working that's where they have their niche okay and so so with developing new markets in on those basis there's on the on the basis of what you've just said standardized machines with volume components um don't sound like to me the future is the future really customized technology for different manufacturing purposes and that that actually we're not but we're no longer buying boxes of machine you know of, of kit it's going to be about the right technology for the right job and it's going to require more sophisticated approach to creating the technology yeah if i can answer that to start because i think some people do use that discrimination to describe industrial mm. so martin said the um, new hampshire heads are industrial heads some so i've heard industrial described as something where you're not making the same box over and over again. So, you know, it's more of a bespoke solution for a manufacturing industry. I don't think that's necessarily true because I'd think that a 3D printer is an industrial printer in many mm. senses, um, particularly most ones we see in the market and growing now. And yet they are boxes with print heads on them and they try and make the same each time. Uh, but I think if we just look back at that comment about where silicon mems came from and the reason that ink printhead manufacturers have silicon mems capability in many cases it's because it came from the home office market where you did make lots of boxes the same and mm. the industrial market is defined really by the fact that it is more diverse than just printing paper as fast as you can mm. <clears throat> just, just on the it's interesting because the the conversation of what's industrial is one of the ones I've had with lots of um, uh, people, and and for me, uh, the definition of industrial is is where <clears throat> in a non-industrial market, a graphics market, the it's the image that you're buying. The sub the carrier is almost irrelevant to to the to the functionality because you know whether whether the image is on a piece of paper or plastic or formex or whatever it is the thing that people buy is the is the image and it just needs to support the image uh, and industrial is is anything where um the thing the image goes on to or the decoration it goes on to has a function uh, that 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 has constraints you know so if you look at things like a um, ceramics market you, you know the the to fire the, the tile it's got to go through an oven at 1100 degrees c which puts constraints on the ink in terms of the ink type, which then puts constraints on the head that you can use. So that, it, whereas if you were just putting the same image on a piece of paper, you could use anything, right? So, so I think so industrial to me is where you've got some functional component as a decoration where the thing on which it's printed is, 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 a, is a functioning item. And the thing that, you know, when we talk about industrial, it's 
you're moving from an analog process where people are currently using um, an analog process. So an interesting new application that we see is, is the sort of the black bit around car windscreens. Uh, and, and, and that's moving very quickly from uh, analog to digital. And, and it's kind of an unusual application because it's just a black strip around a, a windscreen, but it's moving to, to inkjet. But there's all sorts of other constraints on that fluid that, that mean that actually it's quite a challenging fluid to, uh, to print. It's not just standard black ink. And that means that the choice of head that you have is, is, is narrow because the, the fluid can't change to meet the head requirement. The head, the fluid has to be the fluid because um, mm. it, has, it has end user properties which, have, which are really requ required in, 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 in the end user products. And, and so, you know, once you've actually got an industrial process where the end product has a function and therefore that puts constraints on the ink, so therefore you've got to have it at a certain viscosity, you've got to have a certain pigment loading, you've got to have a certain pig particle size, all of those things can't really change. You're then down to, well, what are my options for printhead? And that's where I think, you know, bulk gives you the widest operating window. And if you're in that space, you know, the choice of printhead should be which gives me the widest operating window and which gives me the it's not necessary but none of these applications are about speed or cost it's does it work is it reliable can mm -hmm. i actually get my fluid to to, to jet you know um, the volume of heads to print the entire world's windscreens it's, it's not that it's not that great right <laughs> it's a nice it's a, mm. it's a niche uh, area but i think there's lots of these niches um around um, and, and, and that's kind of where you know where we're focusing our attention on because that's where I think mm. we're, 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 we're the strongest in, in that. But I think it's going for, for, from an application basis, you've got to look at what's there, as, it, as Richard talks about the ink several times. That's the thing I think is actually the most challenging bit to get to get right. It's the ink that will define the head, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks for that. And in, <clears throat> so, go on. Yeah, I, I agree on that. Uh, by, by the way, I'm perfectly fine to um, uh, distinguish between uh, bulk and, uh, and, and thin film and uh, leave the industrial uh, as, as an application. I, I entirely agree with, uh, you know, the so-called triangle of uh, the printhead, the ink and the substrate uh, has to be dialed in. And the ink is a very important part in, in the future. It's even uh, also the substrate and, and uh, the scratchability and other elements on and then, of course, like um, um, John said, the curing uh, of it. The fourth element, of course, now is uh, the real application. Can the application be done with a printer? Can it be done with a print engine, which is plugged in as a as a solution? Or what is you know how is the application uh, actually um, uh, uh, solved in uh, for the customer's uh, best benefit? Okay, yeah, I agree. And I started my career printing displays with OLED materials. And so it, that's absolutely a completely dialed in situation from almost every equipment perspective, all brought together, ink, printer, um, uh, in terms of motion control and print head. And that was a using one of the earliest silicon MEMS um, modified uh, Q-class print heads, Martin. In in the mid in the mid of 1990s at HP, I was in the semiconductor optoelectronic, and we decided we had to decide whether we go into you know LED and make uh, you know uh, LEDs for streetlights or whether we make OLED. And at that time, we decided uh, we make streetlight LED, bulk LED, uh, rather than OLED because uh, we thought OLED will go into will go into inkjet uh, printing, and uh, you know it took more than 20 years and uh, you know C CD CDT was one of the early, uh, <clears throat> early yeah. people so some technologies take a long time uh, but mm. they they keep coming now all that printing is uh, is actually coming as a manufacturing technology you know mm. yeah and it's enabled really by silicon mems technology to give for precision right right and one pigolito, for example, right? Very I, small, uh, tiny droplets with directionality. Martin, I can remember coming to you as a customer 20 years ago and asking for one pigolito. That's right. Pigolito, That's right. Pigolito, right? And, and you, you, you almost laughed at the, the, the time. <laughs> I said, you must be right. crazy. Um, but, I think it, it, but I think it's that ability to get down to, uh, you know, one pigolito, which is 
you know, we, you know, when you think about it, one picoliter, that's a, a litre, split it into a thousand pieces, then take that, split it into a thousand pieces, take that, and then split it into a thousand pieces again. And that's what you, you that's one picoliter. Um, and it's just an incredibly small volume of ink. And, and, and most inkjet systems are producing two billion drops of ink at that size per, per second. And it, the, 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 the technology is incredible and was unthinkable 20 years ago. I remember thinking one picoliter is just, is just crazy, but now it's, now it's every day. Now it's, it's worth absolutely mentioning all, sorry, sorry, Richard. Mark. I was about to say, it's just worth mentioning of uh, all of you as bulk B8. So head suppliers do offer small droplet sizes as well with that technology. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the, hmm. uh, absolutely. There's, there's, Again, nozzle size is not a function of um, the 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 Pietro right. technology, but it's but again, it's interesting. There is a choice, it, you know. I, the 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 the, um, the optimum size of um, droplet because the smaller the drop is, the more you need to print at a certain speed, and you know you sacrifice speed for resolution and and, and drop size, and it's not always obvious that the smallest drop is is the best one for your application, and. Uh, you know, all of those things need to be factored in. The choice of a print head for your application is a really difficult one, and that's where you know it's a good job, Mark, and because you that you it gives you a good a good living. Uh, Telling people do that because it's it's not an easy thing to do. You know, it's not trivial to uh, to find the right head. Yeah, and once you've got that head, it's helping people actually get the ink through it as well, which is probably one of the, mm-hmm. the battles we all collaborate on. So. Yes. Is it, it, just before we sort of wrap up, any sort of further comments anyone would like to make? Well, I'd like I'd like to say the the the, the small drop uh, thing, uh, I, and and also it sort of goes to there's two tracks: there's speed and um, image quality. And Mark, you put that in inverted commas earlier on. Um, I put resolution the, the, in inverted commas. Yes, you did. Yes, um, and I, the the two word, the two phrases are actually used inter- with uh, interchangeability too often. But those small drops that seemed unthinkable all those years ago, they're now commonplace. I and mean, we, 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 some people would say that a one peak liter drop is necessary to get image quality, and they'd say that twelve hundred DPI is necessary. Um, but when you're throwing a drop over a gap, um, a, a mass of a fluid over a gap. You, you you have to be able to jet it faster if it's smaller to get it where it needs to go. Um, that's a bit oversimplistic, but uh, that that's in, in principle you do because it's mass times velocity squared. So if you want the drop to have mo- momentum to overcome what it's got to overcome in that gap, you have to jet it fast. And if you're jetting it like that, you're putting en- energy into a tiny drop of fluid and you have to jet it straight. Now, image quality, that goes back into image quality because theoretically – it should be better if you do small drops and many of them. Um, in reality, you actually see as a consumer of print, whether it's on a package on the supermarket shelf or whatever, you actually see the imperfections in a print. So the defects are more of a factor in the print quality than the theoretical factors that, that are on the trump cards, um, like drop size and resolution. So, so that's one factor. And then touching on the speed part, I, I agree with Martin that a lot of these things, they, they, they don't need a separate printer. They don't need, even need it to be in a separate printing specialist place. There's people looking for industrial processes of fluid deposition to be um, in, in line with the rest of the process. And the print is usually only part of the process. So in that sense, the, the, the speed requirement is governed by the requirements of the previous and subsequent processes. Um, and there are examples where there are people building printers to go at 100 meters a minute when the actual inline process speed for that would be 38 meters a minute. Uh, that doesn't seem to make sense. Um, so I, I think that's a whole different topic. But um, I think mm. we all we all choose what we drive, according to apart from pocket um, and how much money we've got in it. Um, we choose what we drive because we need to carry certain things on certain journeys and we need to do it with certain frequency. And um, uh, there are some, some vehicles, if we call a print head a vehicle um, for, for, for the ink, there are some vehicles that can go really, you know, they're quite sexy. Um, they can go fast and they can do all of those things. But most times everything is governed by the speed limit. And there are natural hey, limits to industrial processes. Okay, thank you for that. Any other final comments before we finish? 
I think Richard, you just kind of uh, mm. concluded us nicely there. So yeah, it summed seems it to me sort of con- yeah summed it up. So in summary, there's a place for both. The economics are obviously a factor going forward. We'll see. We haven't really touched on COVID, which is refreshing in itself. But um, let, let's let's hope that an impact of that is is accelerating adoption of new markets for inkjet, which I sense is um, mooted to happen. We've also heard from an economist whose title is get ready for the coming boom. So when the boom starts to get traction, I expect to see inkjet businesses flourishing. And thank you to all of you for joining me today. Very interesting uh, discussion. Um, Thanks for dialing in so early um, from California, Martin. And thank you, Mark, John, and Richard.